Ingrid Fraser. There is no party like a Newfoundland kitchen party, and we are having the biggest Newfoundland kitchen party anywhere.
These transplanted Europeans brought with them their culture, their musical traditions, their songs and their stories, and a distinct society evolved. Newfoundlanders and the outports depended on each other for their survival. They also looked to each other for a bit of fun and entertainment. To a party, everyone had to do something. Sing a song or do a step dance or recite a poem or, or something like that. That everyone had to, to share in the, in the, as they went around the kitchen, the kitchen, the, the kitchen party or the kitchen record, they used to call them at that time. But the older ladies, uh, I was amused by, they, they'd sit by the, somewhere and put their hand up under their chin and they'd, they'd diddle the tunes. Now that's what the people used to dance to. And everyone would be out going right to town on One sort of uh, venue, if you like, for the singing of songs has completely disappeared. And that, that was the, the hall up shanty. Some song that had a regular rhythm that everybody could pull at the same time. I've interviewed people who can remember waking up in the early morning and hearing crowds of men singing the same song.
I believe it must have dawned on him that these songs that he was used to hearing and that he heard in people's kitchens, they weren't written down anywhere. They were just, uh, you know, he was hearing them from place to place, and I guess he had the thought of, you know, it might be an idea if I collected some of these uh, in a booklet or a songster, and being the, the smart merchandiser he always was, he said, you know, I can I can do that, and I can put some ads in, in the songster for my products and kill two birds with the one stone. So that was in 1927. Yeah. Big Six, 
an influential radio program named after the family retail and clothing store. The show ran from the mid-30s to 1974. Everybody didn't have a radio. So they used to, some of the friends used to go to the person who had a radio, and I'm talking about the outports uh, all over Newfoundland. They'd gather on a Thursday night at 9 o'clock to listen to the Big Six program, and on a Saturday morning at 9.30, and they'd come into somebody's kitchen to listen to the, to the music. They wouldn't miss it. There was a wild colonial boy, Jack Duggan was his name. Big Six would be on, and somebody would sing a, a song. Like, I remember in particular one song was uh, The Wild Colonial Boy. Well, my Aunt Lil knew another version of it where, you know, The Wild Colonial Boy wasn't Jack Duggan, he was Jim Doolan or something like that. So there'd be big uh, arguments start up. Somewhere in the the Big Six broadcast mostly McNulty recordings. Peter, Eileen, and Ma McNulty were Irish American. I think that the fact that the McNulty family sang all these records was very instrumental in a lot of Newfoundlanders, young and old, who took a great interest in the Irish songs and even went out and bought a accordion or a banjo and listened to them and uh, got the records home, learned the words and all that, and sang the songs and uh, became very involved with, with music. Dad was telling me last week that John White, who was a beloved singer locally, um, used to go down to the Big Six once a week, every week, to ask if any new McNulty family records had arrived. And then he would show them any new ones, and he would buy them and take them home and learn them. Several local singers recorded McNulty tunes. The McNulty's returned the compliment. Dear Mr. Devine, I have just received your song when I mowed Pat Murphy's Meadow in the sunny long ago. I am delighted with it. It is lovely and indeed is a, a typical McNulty number. Thanks a million. Best wishes, Anne McNulty. And then so they did go on to actually record the song. When I mowed Pat Murphy's Meadow in the sunny long ago. And of course we were delighted with this and I mean because it's a beloved melody so unique. I see the blue of ocean, the distant sail afar, as the maiden in the meadow breaks up dark Lopnaga. There was music soft and tender. Yes, we sure do. 
From east to west and north to south. 43 million daily deliveries. There's no company that covers as much ground in this country. 12 million addresses. And delivers to as many places. 10 million square kilometers. As Canada Post. All right, it's on its way. Well, that was easy. We're in business to serve. Canada Post. Long history as former Premier Alderdice greets the Royal Commissioners arriving from England. I think there were two major things that happened to us, two huge blows, uh, if you want to talk about the psyche of a people. The first blow was when we gave up responsible government. That was a blow. I don't think Confederation with Canada or anything comes close to you know, being such a serious wound as that was. And the second one was the moratorium. In 1934, the moratorium was half a century away. Newfoundland returned to British rule that year, and a new sound came to the airwaves. The R&B Mellon was the name of a boat, a fictional boat, that traveled all over the world with its crew of very musical, very funny, very handy fellows, Newfoundlanders. And if you think of the date that they started, January 1934, this was just one month before the Newfoundland government essentially collapsed. There was a huge malaise, a political and cultural malaise in Newfoundland in 1934. Well, these guys came along and suddenly, you know, they, they weren't saying anything political, but they were certainly saying, well, we're Newfoundlanders, we can, we can keep up with the rest of the world in the most modern of media, radio. So they really were giving voice to people's feelings of, of pride at a time when they really needed it. Oh, this is the place where the fishermen gather in oilskins and boots and cave vans batten down. All sizes of figures with squid lines and jiggers, they congregate here on the squid jig and drum. What happened in 1941 was this was after the Americans had come to St. John's and started building up petrol. And everybody who, who could stand on two feet was able to get a job with the Americans down there. So one by one, the boys dropped out and uh, they went to work at Pepper where they couldn't afford the time to rehearse, they couldn't afford the time to be on the show. Newfoundland had really changed. There was a huge amount of optimism about the country by 1941. The Americans romanced Newfoundlanders with more than jobs and cash. Their music was slick and glamorous. Stations on the military bases pumped out jazz and country. People all over the province began tuning into country radio like WWVA, Wheeling, West Virginia. Local programs began to broadcast country music as well. Radio had no competitor. Radio was the only electronic medium then. And if you were on radio, uh, you were big time. Jimmy Linegar became a star through the Great Eastern Oil Bargain Hour. Starting in 1952, you could hear the Kid Ranger throughout the week. In the spring and summer, Jimmy toured the outports. People often carried chairs from home to their school or parish halls to see Newfoundland's first Western star. I didn't really have any complaints about not doing traditional music back then. I think back then people who played the button accordion and everything must have thought of themselves as second-class citizens. They looked up to anybody. They looked up to anybody who came from St. John's. We were just the same as we treat somebody who comes from the States. Elvis Presley had just taken off. Not from Cape Canaveral, but from wherever he was. He just took off just like one of those rockets. Bang! Elvis was everywhere. And when I spoke to Mr. McDonald at the Great Eastern Oil and Import Company, he decided that people were looking for other kinds of music now and that perhaps it was time to play records on the Bargain Hour program. All the kids were asking for Elvis music, for rock and roll music, and I wasn't playing that, so I was sort of allowed to fade off into the sunset. Everything changed. I think we felt swept along with the rest of the world for the first time. 
we actually felt that we were part of something much bigger than just our little tiny, you know, isolated little island. Young Newfoundlanders were more than observers. The Ravens, the Ducats, the Dumonts, the Bel Airs, and other bands performed for dances around the province. You couldn't find an accordion anywhere when these guys rocked the stage. I personally was not much interested in the music of my parents. That's a natural thing. It's like, you know, every generation reviles or rejects the music of their parents. I grew up basically, you know, a rock and roll fan, rock and roll, rhythm and blues. That was what interested me, not, uh, not the squid jig and ground or the Gerald S. Doyle songbook or any of that stuff. That was mom and dad's old stuff. I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I didn't certainly want to play it and I wasn't interested in listening to it. Traditional music was still around, but it was mostly relegated to the kitchen where it was thought to belong. Radio stations were programming rock and roll and country. Then, in 1955, an Icelandic Canadian arrived from Manitoba. Omar Blondell, also known as Sagebrush Sam, landed a job at VOCM as soon as he got to St. John's. Went in there and, and told the station manager that he was you know, a singer and so on. And the station manager uh, stepped out of the office for a moment and came back with this book, which was the Doyle Collection, the, the third edition, which had just come out. Showed it to him and said, uh, "Can you sing any of these?" And he looked there and he he never seen any of them. And um, but he could read music and he read through them and, and he was really uh, enchanted, you know, taken with this stuff. And Luke is book got a fine for cutty, ha ha. Maybe for Luke is book got a fine for cutty and every scene is cheeked with putty, ha ha. Ma la ma la, me little I say. He was the first person to do Newfoundland songs on the radio with a guitar accompaniment. And, and and he eventually, ultimately, recorded, I think, there were 75 songs in that third edition of, of Doyle, the 55 edition. He recorded 50 of those songs. As we walked on the sand at the close of the day, I thought of me wife who was back in Torbay. I knew that she'd kill me if only she knew. I was courting a lassie in Harbor Lagoon. The 50s was a time when, in many ways, there was a lot of pressure to move away from the past. There was uh, a lot of mainland culture coming in, and that was what was popular. And here was somebody who was coming from outside and embracing local culture and giving it a lot of uh, prominence. You may talk of Claire and Old and Fowler, anything you choose. One of Omar's 45s featured an accordion player from Conception Harbor. Wilt Doyle's sound caught the attention of the record company owner. He just couldn't describe the sound. He said there's a, a no music. He said, Charles <laughs> Taylor said this. He was Scotch, and he knows Scotch music, he knows Irish music, and he, he knew uh, the difference in, in the music. But he said, uh, this is a new music. He said, that's a different, uh, it's not Irish, it's not Scotch. He said, what is it? I said, it's Newfoundland music. First the record I cut was uh, the jigs and reels of Newfoundland. That was recorded in 56. That went on for years as an LP. They're still in the store, still being sold. Wilt Doyle was one of the first Newfoundlanders to make a commercial recording. He traveled the province with his band through the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, playing the old time music. And he constantly promoted Newfoundland music on the radio. So I said, if I keep my name on the radio long enough, when anyone uh, I'll think of music, they'll think of Wolf Doyle. So, work. Doug 
late was one of the hosts, and Doug was telling me one time that he was into the store up on Golf Avenue somewhere, buying something. And the girl behind the counter looked at him and said, You must have John White. And he said, I beg your pardon. She said, You must have John White. <laughs> and finally, he, <laughs> what she was saying was, you bees on John White. <laughs> because the show, many in many places, the show was John White. I'm a young married man and I'm tired of me life. Ten years I've been wed to a pale sickly wife. She has nothing to do, only sit down and cry. Praying for praying to God she would die. There were a number of people involved in a radio show at CBC called Saturday Night Jamboree. We simply were told that CBC was coming here. They would be looking for a group to do a, a, a show featuring Newfoundland's Irish traditional type music. And uh, we were given the opportunity to do that in October of 64. This is the CBC Television Network. And to get us in a happy mood, Ray Walsh with his button accordion and a medley of Newfoundland favorites. We have to give our people a sense that, of our worth. We are worth something. We do have our own culture, our own talent, our own accents. And we needed something like that desperately to combat this flood of, of Canadian material and Canadian talent that was coming into us at that time. The local programs gave Newfoundlanders a chance to see for themselves the first time a lot of the artists that they heard about for years on radio but uh, couldn't put a face to. And it also brought a lot of new talent out into the open, which never had a chance to get exposure before. But it was really important when people in the smaller communities saw the, the traditional singers on television and the traditional fiddle players and the traditional accordion players, and because so, and all of a sudden that that put them up on an equal footing with uh, Elvis Presley or whoever else was competing for time. And I think All Around the Circle had a tremendous influence there, uh, especially because of John White. I bought her a bottle and just her to try. The way that she drank it, I thought she would die. I bought her another, but it vanished the same. And then she took cod liver, I love the grain. So many of the songs that John sang were either traditional songs of Johnny Burke or songs that had been out of the Gerald S. Doyle songbook, or they were McNaughty songs, and John kept that alive.
Montana with exclusive Montana vision, built-in monitor and video cassette player. Built for drivers and their families. 80th anniversary. Wow, win a free cruise. 10, 11. Hmm, best selection of furniture. 23. Best selection of appliances. 28. 29. Best selection of flooring and carpet. 32. Betty, what are you doing over there? Seeing how many months till 2003. Why? Because there's no money down, no interest till 2003. My. You gotta be talking about the Cohen sale. Newfoundland Power is built on a tradition of service. It's a tradition we've upheld for over 100 years by finding the best people to provide personal one on one care by investing in technology that makes every service experience one of ease and convenience, by upgrading our electrical system to world-class standards, and finding better ways to serve our customers by just listening to them. This is our tradition of service. This is Newfoundland Power. Perhaps you've outgrown your starter home and would like to get into something larger. Or perhaps your present dwelling is well, a little on the old side, and you want a newer home. Or perhaps you've changed jobs and have to relocate. Whatever your real estate needs, get Canada's top producers working for you, the cream of the crop. They're at REMAX, Canada's leading real estate organization. In the 1950s and 60s, Newfoundlanders began packing up and heading here to Toronto looking for a better life. Harry Hibbs was one of them. Little did he know that chance would make him a celebrity with his little red button accordion and his salt and pepper hat. The salt was shining the night that we parted. I held you and kissed you and called you my own. In words sweet and tender, you said that you'd love me and I recall being in the end of Toronto where the Caribou Club was going on, and I uh, drove down to the corner of the college in Bathurst and heard the accordion music and went upstairs, and there was a place called the Caribou Club with uh, Newfoundlanders and Newfoundland food and Newfoundland music, and it was uh, like going back, as someone said, to the rock. <laughs>
television show aired in Ontario for seven years. Her mother said... And when Harry Hibbs toured, he performed for sellout crowds all over the country. I mean, when we first hit Newfoundland with that music, uh, we were totally astonished by it. Not far from Portobast, there's a little town there, Chicknick Lodge, I think it was called. And we did this dance there. And we were on the stage, and the people are dancing stomp. And well, you could see the, 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 the floor had to be going like this back and forth because the curtains were going like this on the wall. And we thought it was the weirdest thing. But that's everywhere we went, we had the same kind of response, and it was, it was just wonderful. A lot of Newfoundlanders, whether they liked what Harry Hibbs was playing or whether they didn't, they all flocked to where he was playing because the music brought Newfoundland to us. Newfoundland now is it's gone past the boundaries of the island, you know. There's lots of fish and brews being consumed right here in the city of Toronto and uh, I think when people, you know, have their Newfie music on and have their Newfie meals, uh, in a way they're kind of like reliving Newfoundland again. Toronto isn't the only destination for Newfoundlanders. In fact, there are so many expatriates in Brampton today that major supermarkets stock purity products. But there's a hunger for more than just hardtack and jam jam. And that's why the excitement is so high at the Rose Town Inn when Newfoundland musicians are on stage. Come gather all around me and I'll sing to you a tale About the boys at Carmel who all want to the tale After on another night when all hands with the street We crept up over Joe's house and we stole our brownies
Have you heard about Cohen's 80th anniversary giveaway? $12,000 in prizes, including a cruise. Now you could win either your purchase free, a home office package with hutch, computer, desk, the work, or a cruise for two, including airfare. All you gotta do is shop at any one of Cohen's 28 fine stores for your chance to win. Cohen's Home Furnishings, serving the people of Newfoundland and Labrador for 80 years. Proud to be a sponsor of tonight's program. There are hundreds of people across Newfoundland who share the same commitment, a commitment to this province. They keep it every day by providing reliable service to over 170,000 customers, including their own families, their own friends, in their own communities. From the Port of Port Peninsula to the southern shore, they're noticed most when they're needed most. They are part of a tradition of service. They are Newfoundland power. Right now, the Cavalier sedan comes with air conditioning, four-speed automatic with traction control, and power locks with remote keyless entry. The Chevrolet Cavalier 2000 value package. More features than ever. $218 a month or 1.9% purchase financing. Hi, I'm Ingrid Fraser, just one of the people who bring you news, information, and entertainment on CBC Radio and Television. In this 50th year of Confederation, we're celebrating the role of CBC in the history and culture of this region. Come to our open house Sunday, October 3rd at CBC Radio and Television stations in Cornerbrook, Grand Falls, Windsor, Gander, Goose Bay, and St. John's. Tour the studios, meet the staff. There'll be entertainment and special guests, too. Sunday, October 3rd at 2 p.m. Tonight's special presentation brought to you in part by Cohen's Home Furnishing, your local GM dealer, and Newfoundland Power.
Saturday and by Wednesday night I mean the place was full and people were singing along so most of the songs they were singing and this really impressed me that the music was so popular in this part of the world.
them uh, when they'd be glad to have those uh, old Newfoundland songs and whatnot that they'd say on the one thing or another. And I do hope, I hope they'll be there for them to get. I'd be very happy uh, uh, when I was born if I thought that someone had my songs to use them and to sing them when I'm 